Welcome to the Longevity Forum podcast, a series on achieving longer, healthier, and more fulfilled lives for as many as possible. On this episode, Andrew J. Scott, co-founder of the Longevity Forum, will be interviewing Odid Galore, economist at Brown University and founder of the Unified Growth Theory. I'll leave the rest to you, Andrew. Thank you, Laura, and thank you, Oded, for uh, agreeing to spend some time with us. It is a pleasure to be with you, Andrew. And congratulations on the success of your book, The Journal of Humanity. It's uh, a great read. I I love some of the endorsements you got. I see Glenn Lowry says that it's a a suspense-filled thriller full of surprises, mind-bending puzzles, and profound insights. What a great description for an economic book, Oded. Indeed, really pleasing and uh, delighted to, to be able to diffuse the knowledge that I accumulated in the past uh, three decades to, to the general public. And of course, the book is in some ways about the dissemination of uh, knowledge throughout human experience of how over 300,000 years Homo sapiens have developed to this point where we are today. And of course, the, the theme of the book is how around 200 years ago there was a transformative change that just Uh, broke through a struggle that characterized most of human existence. And your framework to explain that is this unified growth theory. Uh, Do you want to tell us a little bit about that unified growth theory, Oded? Yes. Uh, So so unified growth theory is an attempt to uh, understand the evolution of human societies since uh, the emergence of uh, Homo sapiens in Africa uh, nearly 300,000 years ago. And to a large extent, it surrounds uh, two of the most fundamental mysteries that characterize this journey. One mystery that I define as the mystery of growth, namely what brought about the dramatic transformation in living standards in the past uh, few centuries after literally 300,000 years of stagnation. Namely, what brought about this 14-fold increase in living standards in the past uh, 200 years and what uh, contributed to the um, doubling of life expectancy in the past two centuries. And the second mystery is the mystery of inequality. Namely, what are the roots of this enormous inequality that exists in the wealth of nations? why some countries are poor and others are rich, and why in the past two centuries we see an incredible divergence in the wealth of nations uh, across the globe. And unified growth theory is uh, operating under the, uh, the conviction that much of the inequality that we see across the globe today is originated in the distant past. And consequently, it is vital to understand the growth process in its entirety and the forces that operated in the distant past in order to shed light on the inequality that is prevalent in the world today and to shed light on the design of policies that can mitigate the level of inequality as we see it at the moment. One of the threads that runs through the book is this theory of of history and accumulation that's long run impact and you certainly suggest that you know development isn't through a sequence of one-off lucky breaks but much more systematic factors so if we go back to this transformation that begins two three hundred years ago um this extraordinary increase in uh human uh, living standards what for you were the key elements of that breakthrough um that has led us to where we are today all right, so in the book, uh, The Journey of Humanity, I try to decipher uh, the wheels of change, namely the forces that brought about ultimately the transition from stagnation to growth, and why these forces operated in a different pace across the globe, namely why so some societies are taking off at the beginning of the 19th century, where others are continue to lag behind and consequently contribute to the emergence of this vast inequality across the globe. So when we think about the wheels of change, I identify three important wheels of change that govern the journey of humanity. The first one is the scale of the human population. The second one is the adaptation of the human population, namely the composition of the human population. And the third one is technological progress. 
And I argue that in the course of human history, these wheels of change are rotating, reinforcing one another, and ultimately bringing humanity into the verge of this takeoff that occurs nearly 200 years ago. So when we think about the initial population, the initial human population in Africa 300,000 years ago, naturally this is a modest population in terms of scale. But this population, nevertheless, is equipped with an incredible and powerful human brain. And this incredible and powerful human brain permits the population to advance technologies. And this advancement in technologies is feeding back into the scale of the population and into the composition of the population. The science that technological progress expands resources, permit more children to survive, permit more children to be born, and con consequently contribute to population growth. But in addition, technological change is contributing to human adaptation. And the feedback from technological progress to population size and human adaptation, and back from human adaptation and technological size into a technological progress, is accelerating technological progress in the course of human history. But when we think about this 300,000 years of stagnation, this is a time period in which, to a large extent, human prosperity is unchanged. Technological progress is bringing a temporary increase in income per capita, but ultimately population size is adjusting and income per capita is reverting back to the previous equilibrium position. Nevertheless, this period of stagnation is associated at the same time with great dynamism in the context of technology, population, and human adaptation. And it is this great dynamism that at any point in time is not very powerful, but over 300,000 years it amounts to an incredible change that is ultimately bringing humanity into the phase of modern economic growth. So why is it the case? Over the course of human history, technological progress becomes more and more rapid. But nevertheless, in an absolute scale, it is relatively slow. And as a result of it, it doesn't require an investment in human capital, an investment in education, so as to allow individuals to cope with this rapidly changing technological environment. But after 300,000 years of change, the technological environment is changing very rapidly. And due to this change in the technological environment, education becomes essential in permitting individuals to cope with this rapidly changing technological environment. And consequently, responsible parents, say in England at the beginning of the 19th century, realize that in order to equip their children to the new world of technological change, they need to educate their children. They start to invest in the education of their children, but naturally their resources are very limited. They need to economize on other elements in their budget. They cannot economize on their consumption because their consumption is very close to the subsistence level. So they for they're forced to economize on the scale of the, of the children, on the number of children. And consequently, this investment in human capital is associated with dramatic decline in fertility rates. And this is very important because declining fertility is freeing the growth process from the counterbalancing effect of population and permits economic growth to, uh, to be sustained in the very long run. So what brought about the transition is the acceleration in technological progress, the rise in the demand in, in, for human capital beyond the critical point in which, uh, in which human capital formation is being, uh, is being uh, generated. And consequently, it brought about the decline in fertility and the transition to the modern economic growth. Thank you. And of course, you know, you talked about the unified nature of the growth theory. And as that explanation sort of emphasizes, there's the demographics interacting with also geography, interacting with institutions, interacting with technology, and together they then create this, this, this takeoff point. But do you want to say a little bit more about, you know, another very interesting key message in the book is how the past and the very distant past still shapes our present. What are some of the key channels for you through which any issues around growth and narrowing inequality across the globe 
is still influenced by that past. Right. So, so when I describe the wheels of change, naturally the operation of the wheels of change is not, uh, is not taking place in a vacuum. The wheels of change can rotate more rapidly and less rapidly in, in, in different environments. Naturally, if institutions are conducive for property rights, then technological progress will be faster than otherwise. If cultural traits are such that the human population is predisposed to invest in the education of children, then the process will, uh, will be expedited more than, than otherwise. If the geography is conducive for the development of, uh, of institutions that uh, permits greater cooperation among the human population, then again, the wheels of change will operate uh, faster than otherwise. And therefore, it is really important to understand what are the, uh, the factors that operated in the course of human history that affected the rotation, the rotation in the wheels of change. So we know that this rotation is ultimately bringing about the transition from stagnation to growth. But at the same time, we realize that, that the rotation is, uh, is not at the same pace across the globe due to different initial conditions. But what I show in the context of uh, the journey of humanity is that, uh, that um, if we think about inequality today, inequality today, to a large extent, was determined by forces that operated in the distant past. Hundreds of years ago, thousands of years ago, and even tens of thousands of years ago. In the second part of the book, I start with inequality today, and I march backward in human history, trying to peel different layers of influence that affected the contemporary inequality. I start with the role of colonialism, then with the fingerprints of institutions, the cultural factor, the long shadow of geography, and ultimately the migration of humans out of Africa 60 to 90,000 years ago and its impact on human diversity. And what I show is that each of these elements is important for the understanding of the inequality across the globe. Some elements are deeper than others, some elements are occurring much, uh, much earlier in the course of human history, but all elements at once are really important for the understanding of the pace of the rotation of the wheels of change and ultimate takeoff of humanity from stagnation to growth. So to be more concrete about particular examples, so for instance, if we think about the geographical endowment, what we see in the course of human history is that in some places across planet Earth, farmers or, or, or individuals in general were induced by geographical conditions to be engaged in agricultural investment. They were induced to be engaged in the process of planting and ultimately harvesting. Now, this was critical because this process of planting today and harvesting six months from today implies that individuals were forced to learn how to delay gratification, how to plan for the future, and how to develop this future-oriented mindset that is so critical for the modern economy. Namely, when we think about today's world, what contributes to economic growth is education that requires future-oriented mindset, saving behavior that requires future-oriented mindset, technological adoption and development that requires future-oriented mindset. And the future-oriented mindset is perhaps the most important single cultural characteristics that affect the growth process. And it appears that the geographical environment affected future-oriented mindset differentially across the globe. So if we look at different regions of the world, within continent and across continents, we see greater variation in the agricultural return or the return to agricultural investment. And consequently, say, when we look at different regions of Africa, we see that some societies in Africa were induced to be engaged in agricultural investment, others were not. And consequently, those that were induced to engage in agricultural investment are more future-oriented than otherwise. And this ultimately led into uh, some divergence across society in the course of human history. 
But this is one example how geography affected the emergence of cultural traits in a differential way and affected the rotation of the wheels of change in a differential way and contributed to the divergence as we see it across the globe today. So I want to come back later on to that future orientation, which of course yeah, I think fits in with the lifespan and longevity too. But let's move a little bit on from looking backwards to looking forward. So you know, your book is about going from stagnation to growth. Do you think that growth process will carry on looking forward? Will there be perhaps other uh, nonlinear thresholds that may lead to a major change? What do you think that, that the future will bring for us? Right. So this is, a, this is an interesting and important question. And uh, when we think about the march of humanity in the past 300,000 years, uh, it appears to a large extent that the march of humanity, at least thus far, has been unstoppable. In the sense that when humanity hit uh, an enormous hurdle, human ingenuity was there in time to allow humanity to surpass this hurdle and to continue its march. And ultimately, the grand arc of human development was not affected by any of these elements. You can think about it in the course of, say, the Neolithic Revolution 12,000 years ago. Human societies before the Neolithic Revolution expanded up to the point in which there were no geographical niches that were free for, uh, for hunting and gathering any longer. And as a result of it, hunter-gatherer groups started to bang into one another, conflict emerged, and there was a need to, for human ingenuity to rescue humanity from the potential catastrophe that could have emerged otherwise. And human ingenuity permitted the development of agriculture, namely the domestications of plants, the domestication of animals, and ultimately the transition into an era in which from each acre of land, we can extract sufficient resources to support 100 times more people that we could have supported from the same acre of land under, hunter -gathering, uh, under the hunter and gathering regime. Now, this human ingenuity was there throughout, uh, throughout human history. But nevertheless, when we think about uh, the future, uh, it appears that at the moment, humanity is in fact facing perhaps the greatest challenge uh, of all, namely climate change. And the question is whether climate change will be in fact the, the single uh, uh, most important factor that will ultimately derail humanity indefinitely from its march forward. Now, in this respect, I mean, the journey of humanity, my book is hopeful about the ability of human ingenuity, again, to permit us uh, to rescue ourselves from, uh, from this catastrophe. And this hopefulness is not based on naivete, it is based on the understanding of the processes that led to climate change on the, other, on the one hand, but at the same time led to the development of corresponding processes that are the seeds of the solution for, to climate change. So let me be a little more explicit about it. When we think about climate change, it's coming in the aftermath of what I defined as technological acceleration that brought about the Industrial Revolution, industrial pollution, and the current trend in climate change. But the same acceleration in technological progress, as I said earlier, brought about three additional important forces. Brought about investment in education. It brought about a rapid decline in fertility. And it brought about an incredible power of innovations. And why is it so critical? It is critical because it is the decline in fertility and potentially the decline in the population of the world as a whole that could not reverse but mitigate the current trend of climate change. So as we know, very recently, India even dropped in terms of fertility below replacement level. And if these trends maintain themselves, and if we basically conduct policies such as gender equality, higher return to human capital, greater diffusion of contraceptive methods, then this decline in fertility will be more pronounced than otherwise, then we can reduce 
a, a, an important element that contributes to uh, the current trend of climate change. And this can perhaps permit humanity to have three or four decades that will be necessary in order to develop revolutionary technologies that we cannot envision at the moment that will ultimately permit us to, uh, to reverse the current trend of climate change. So again, it is human ingenuity, along with the decline in fertility and the rise in, the re in, in human capital formation, that will permit us to first adopt environmentally friendly technologies, enforce regulation standards across the globe, be aware of the damage that we create, but at the same time, permit scientists to have three or four decades to take human ingenuity into the next stage and to resolve and reverse part of what we see today in the context of climate change. And, you know, obviously, as you just said, you're, the optimism uh, that comes from the power of human ingenuity, I think, is a theme that really runs through the book and one that I, I like greatly. Of course, human ingenuity now, not just with climate change, but also with AI and bioengineering, also has developed technology that seems for the first time ever to offer existential threats to humanity. So it's interesting that you're saying there about the population that it, it may give us a, a window to develop these new technologies. I mean, my worry has always been that actually until we have a sustainable way of living, it doesn't matter whether we have 8 billion or 10 billion. Uh, that's just the speed at which you reach the point where things can no longer be improved. Um, but the pace of change, the pace of technology, is it going too fast compared to our human ingenuity to resolve the problem? Is the demographic population going to be uh, full, going to be working fast enough to help us? Um, so that's an important question, and it's in some sense uh, related to uh, some debate that existed in the past in the context of the limits uh, to economic growth. Uh, are we advancing too fast? I mean, can we adapt to this uh, rapid change in technological change? Can the environment uh, tolerate us uh, much longer? And again, my a hopeful view about the future suggests that uh, if I look back in human history, it appears that, uh, that we started to develop very rapidly at a certain point, and we were in the brink of catastrophe in this respect. But ultimately, human ingenuity, the human brain is unique, human ingenuity was there to, to rescue us. I'm not overly concerned about uh, the, the pace of technological progress and uh, and I think that uh, again the, um, given the fact that uh, fertility is declining and we invest much more in our children than we invested in the past I think that part of what uh, we will invest in is human adaptability and I think that uh, we will see greater ability of the next generations to adapt to this rapidly changing technological environment and as a result of it we will reach a new equilibrium in which technology is advancing very rapidly but at the same time given the scale of the human population given the resources that are spent on each individual uh, adaptation will permit uh, humanity to sustain or to, to coexist with uh, this rapidly changing technological environment. On to some of the demographic issues, because of course this is close to the heart of the Longevity Forum. And, you know, as you said, your book looks at changes in the scale of the human population, the composition of the human population, and the interplay with technological progress. And for me, all three of those come together with longevity. We know, uh, as you just said, we're in many countries, we're going to see falling populations. We're seeing fewer young and a lot more old. Uh, and then we need technology to help us to age better, uh, to sort of make the most of that that longer time. And I think for me, that's a crucial challenge that we face. But fertility rates are now below the 2.1 number that guarantees sustainable populations. How long do you think that process will continue? Do you think we have reached a new moment of human history? where well, we will see permanently shrinking populations and um, a, a fertility rate below two? Yeah, so this is uh, potentially an important concern. Naturally, uh, fertility is declining uh, below uh, replacement in many corners of the world. 
and some are concerned with that the decline in fertility will not permit us to sustain the same rate of technological progress. Some people predict that perhaps technological progress will come to a halt and, uh, and uh, perhaps humanity um, will uh, start to revert back to, uh, to previous uh, conditions. But I do not share this viewpoint and uh, I do not share this viewpoint for the following reason. When you think about the winds of change, as I articulated earlier, I'm referring to the interaction between the size of the population, the composition of the population and technological progress. Namely, it is not only the scale of the population that matters and the scale perhaps will in fact be smaller than otherwise, but the composition or the education or the quality of the human population. So the fact that population will decline to permit parents and societies to invest much more in each particular individual. But when we think about the forces that contribute to technological progress, it appears that the quality of the population, or the elasticity of technological progress with respect to quality, is much greater than with respect to quantity. And in this respect, the decline in fertility rates and potentially the decline in world population, in my viewpoint, is just very good news to the world. We will have less polluting people, the pressure on the environment will be smaller than otherwise, but at the same time, we will be able to cherish and invest in each individual more than otherwise, and ultimately, the effective number of scientists or the effective number of innovators will be much greater than before. In the sense that be able to, uh, to sustain a greater rate of technological progress despite the fact that uh, the scale of the human population is smaller than otherwise. And let me build on that because that, I think, starts to move us towards um, the longevity perspective. So it struck me in reading your book you know, the Malthusian story of, you know, a larger population trapped into uh, uh, low living standards and uh, disease and starvation. And there's sort of a modern version of that today, which is this rising number of older people, which is also painted in sort of bleak terms. There's you know, too many old, old people get ill, they're not productive. Whereas it occurs to me that, you know, your, your shift that you're referring to with children, where we went from quantity to quality also needs to be extended to other stages of life. So we now need to invest much more in improving health and education across the life course. For most of human history, as your book documents, the young haven't had a chance to become old. But now it's almost you know, a guarantee that the young will live to become very old by human standards. What changes do you think that needs to bring about? And how do you think societies will adjust to what is a major change in the human life course? Indeed. So, so as you suggest correctly, we see this dramatic transformation in life expectancy in the past uh, 150 years. We see that life expectancy nearly double within this time, time frame in the world as a whole. And this had great implications uh, that uh, uh, to a large extent were very beneficial for the human society. So naturally, the prolongation of life, increasing the increase, uh, the planning horizon of each individual, and as a result of it, made it much more profitable to individuals to invest in education, to invest in themselves, with the understanding that the duration of the period from, from which they can reap the benefit of this investment is larger than otherwise. But as you suggested, at the same time, this implied that uh, perhaps uh, during the, the change, before we reach a steady state, if the population continued to decline, say, at the same pace, and we will see a gradual increase in the dependency ratio, in the sense that older people are living longer than otherwise, and the number of young individuals or people in the labor force that are supporting them is proportionately smaller. And the question is whether this is uh, detrimental for productivity, whether this is alarming in terms of the sustainability of the growth process and the sustainability of the current trend. 
of uh, fertility decline. And again, my view here is perhaps less pessimistic than the, than the typical view. And it is based precisely on the same mechanism, namely on the quality quantity trade-off. If I think about, say, China and the one-child policy, and I think about the children that were born in the post-one-child policy, on average, these children are significantly more educated, are significantly more productive than their parents. It's true that perhaps one child will have to support two parents, so the dependency ratio is larger than what existed before, but at the same time, the earning capacity of this child is perhaps more than twice the earning capacity of the parents. And in this respect, Technically, the dependency ratio is higher than before, but if we think about quality-adjusted dependency ratio, I do not see the, uh, the, the issue in the sense that I do think that, in fact, the labor force will be so much more productive than the labor force at the time of the parental generation that, in fact, despite the increase in the dependency ratio, the, lab the people in the labor force will be able to support the aging population without great difficulties. It implies that certain resources will have to be allocated to this endeavor, but nevertheless, the society will be rich enough uh, to afford it and, uh, and perhaps even to have a surplus beyond that. I, I hope so too. And I also think, you know, as you said that there's the Journal of Humanity is about uh, investing in the quality of the health and skills of the young, but that also presumably cascades through society as well. The young then become the old, but also we may need to be looking to invest in later life much more as well, uh, which of course for most of humanity has not been uh, a sensible thing to do because so few reach that stage. I think there's also that more uh, dynamic aspect as well. Um, uh, Oda, I, we could talk for uh, ages. You cover 300,000 years of history. Uh, uh, it's a remarkable book uh, and remarkable framing. Uh, I, I think the Unified Growth Theory is a lovely way of approaching this topic. So thank you for your time. Thank you for the insights. And those people listening who are intrigued to know more, I thoroughly recommend the book, The Journal, The Journey of Humanity. So thank you very much, Oda. Thank you very much, Andrew. It was my pleasure. This broadcast has been brought to you by Longevity Forum as part of Longevity Week 2022. For more podcasts, visit our website, thelongevityforum.com, or follow us on Twitter, longevity underscore forum.